This morning's reading comes from Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 12 through to uh, verse 20. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. It's a delight to be with you. I've been looking forward to it very much, as I always do in our church here. And uh, today's one is unusual in the sense that I want to have a look at this issue of does it really matter? People sort of say, oh, you can believe in God and believe in evolution. It doesn't really matter. So I want to address that, and I'm very comfortable with questions. Now, you've got to catch when I'm taking a breath if you um, (laughs) want to get in. But uh, I'm very comfortable with questions and certainly available afterward. And let me begin by saying you will not be disappointed with the message tonight with Ron Neller. I've known him personally now for some years. We've uh, ministered in some churches together, and I'm very impressed with the relevance of his testimony and the warmth of his faith. So don't miss it. There'll be a full bookstall there uh, tonight as well, so it'll be well worth being at. But so I want to begin in this very area where Hayden so kindly read for us. Does it really matter? And the scripture says we are to judge by fruit. And uh, so I want to give you some slides that will touch on that and then look at the evolution itself. But what about the fruit for starters? And uh, let's see how we go. First of all, I want to look at the fact that the psalmist says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. There is no language nor speech where their voice is not heard. Their sound has gone out throughout the earth. So we are reminded biblically that the whole world has a statement of God's creativity and building and scripture in Romans tells us that those who do not believe are without excuse. That is pretty significant but it also means that the people that you and I interact with and share with have already had some kind of a start. But I thought I would just mention that uh, Dr. Dawkins, probably one of the great priests, if I can use that word in inverted commas, of the evolution message, talks about how evolution makes impossible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. In a TV interview, he actually talks about how it was the day that he bought the evolution idea that he felt Christianity was irrelevant. And so that is significant in view of the way he's invested his life in uh, presenting a different message. But uh, when uh, (coughs) Lee Strobel's did research, here's one of his comments. The fossils reveal no progression, but rather boom. All of a sudden we see anthropods uh, absolutely contrary to Darwin's tree of life. And what I want to do in the second floor, the a part of the study now is look at is there a sound basis for the view that God made the world as we read of it in, Eve- uh, in Genesis chapter 1. And I just mentioned one that might surprise you. Um, this is a book one of my very good friends recommended to me called God is Back, written just over 10 years ago. And the author, one is an atheist and other a Roman Catholic, and they have researched around the world the way in religion is on the rise in all of the countries of the globe. And uh, I thought you might be interested, and so I I really quote a book, as most of you know, but I wanted you to hear word for word how they describe going to a home group in communist China 10 years ago. 
and uh, they begin, he's there, he's welcomed, they've all rocked up in BMWs and the like, and then he mentions the discussion gradually of revelation gives way to a passionate attack on Darwinism. Evolutionary theory, argues Wang, the leader, breaking into English to reiterate his words, is the biggest lie because it pretends to be rigorous science. This is immediately confirmed by the biotechnologist who works on stem cells. Every day she looks at them admiring their beauty and their complexity and says it must be divine. If you trust evolution, you distrust God, rejoins a surgeon who is in the circle. Evolution is another false side, not idol, not unlike Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism and the other mock religions that China's communists are trying to promote. Now they've discovered that they cannot kill God. I find that a very interesting comment from people who are not holding a Christian faith, but they've done some research and listening to their comments on the world religious context. I think if we're going to say, does it matter, here's a government committed to an atheistic position, wanting to ban anything that would support a creationist viewpoint. And I could give you some other examples, but that will be sufficient. But I do note that Peter, writes at the back of the New Testament that scoffers will come in the last days uh, following their own sinful desires and saying, well, where is the promise of his coming? Everything's been the same as it's been for years and years. But they deliberately forget that God made the heavens by the word of his command. And so Peter is reminding us that the creation message does matter. Um, and so, oh, here's one you might mull on. Does anybody have some friends who are forever after them to give them the stories about uh, tribulations and rapture and all of the other details that are supposed to come before our Lord's return. Anybody got some friends like that besides me? Hello? I thought you might be interested in a comment you can reflect on. It's, it's a little digression, but it's brief. God did not give us details regarding the future so that we could spend hours on elaborate plans, but so that we would know that he is not caught by surprise. What happens in your life and mine comes as no surprise. I've been dipping into Daniel recently and observing the way God told Daniel centuries before some of the events that happened. God knew what was going to happen. He is not caught by surprise and that I think is the supreme lesson of the prophecies of the good book. So, but there are some questions that demand answers and that's where I want to go now. First there was nothing and then it exploded. Hello? Is this supposed to be science? First there was nothing and then it exploded. So what is the it that exploded if there was nothing? I left out, I've cut back my slides drastically, but uh, my own, I did a full science major at high school and then my university studies and doctoral studies went on into the area of what happened in the past, which is essentially the backdrop of the evolutionary issue. We're talking about stuff that's happened in the past. And so, uh, is it supposed to be science when there was nothing and that nothing exploded? So, but uh, from whence then came the cosmic egg? Now, the quote is from Isaac Asimov, and uh, Asimov, his book's called A New Guide to Science, and Asimov was an atheist. Now, he's died, so he now knows that God's there. But as an atheist, this is what he has said. I find this quite fascinating. In his book, what happened before the Big Bang? Where did the cosmic egg come from? Needless to say, there is no evidence yet for the appearance of a cosmic egg out of nothing or for a multiplicity of universes. And there may never be, but it would be a harsh world indeed if scientists were not allowed to speculate poetically in the absence of evidence. Hello? Is that relevant when we're asking whether there is a scientific base for this view of evolution in regards to our uni universe and the past? Again, please feel free to ask questions afterwards, I won't mind. That is probably the saddest picture in my slides. I reflect on what lies behind that dear girl and some hopes. Fifty some years of ministry, I've done a few funerals. And I have to tell you that to say evolution was God's method with death from the very start has some significant implications. So get, death is a good thing. God saw all that he had made and it was good. It was very good. Try saying that at a funeral. 
One of the places we used to camp in the west was uh, alongside of a, a, a site where there was a picnic area and so forth, free camping. And, uh, and one year in a flood, the water went over the top of the dam and a young lass was drowned. And uh, when we went for a walk, I noticed the spot where her grave was. And there were all these butterflies and wings and all sorts of stuff all around the site. And yet I thought to myself, after you've tacked the last butterfly onto the last bit of the wire fence, there is still an awful ache. My younger son, when he did overseas service with the Australian Army, on one occasion was awarded the Brigadier's Award. I was so excited. <laughs> I thought, oh, I can't wait to ring up my dad and... Oh, never mind. Because <laughs> dad's gone. And there are moments in each of our lives when there are things you'd love to say to special people who've gone on. And we do well to remember when the scripture says God all, saw all that he had made, it was very good. I do not find there a place for a system where death is integral. As soon as you talk about the survival of the fittest, what are you saying about the unsurvival, non-survival of the unfit? So, so it's going to affect how we view God. What kind of a God would call that process good? Now, I'm going to give you a quote. I know this is for the Wrinklies, but does anybody remember a song that we used to sing when I was younger? None of Self and All of Thee, Some of Self and All of Thee by Theodore Mono. He was a French uh, Christian author. Beautiful song. This is his grandson. Listen to what he says. Evolution is the more cruel because it is a process of elimination of destruction. The struggle for life and the elimination of the weakest is a horrible process against which our whole modern ethics revolts. I am surprised that a Christian would defend the idea that this is the process God more or less set up in order to have evolution. And he's writing as an atheist recognizing the inconsistency uh, and look i was in high school the first year that evolution was brought into queensland schools in 1962 does that kind of sound like last century <laughs> um, my teacher wrote the textbook you may be sure that we included the chapter on evolution as a part of our year 11 and 12 studies so i remember it quite vividly but sadly we have been told lies and that is the truth. For example, Haeckel's drawings were drawn in the mid-19th century and they were challenged by the scientists in Germany within a decade as saying they're not true to the evidence. When they confronted Ernst Haeckel, he said, oh, well, uh, my artists took a, a, a some liberties. He didn't mention that he was the artist. No one then would have known how profoundly his writings would influence a German corporal come leader named Adolf Hitler. Just for your interest, that's a picture of what they really look like after the photographs have been taken. Can you see the vast difference between the lie and that diagram, the top one, was in the year 12 exams, just in the last four, two or three years, four or five years, whatever it was, in New South Wales even though it's been discredited all this time and the data is there to show us that it's not true to reality, it is still included in exams and the like. And it's a fraud, nothing more or less. So, uh, I rate, rate it as a deliberate deception. But let me give you a couple more areas that might interest you if you've got a bit of a science bent. Uh, some of the theories about millions of years are just not true. Do you see all these layers along the... Uh, the wall of the canyon. Uh, that was Mount St. Helens before it uh, erupted in 1982 and the lava streamed down. You can see where it came out this side of the mountain and flowed down the valley and uh, there's a picture of the canyon one afternoon 40 meters deep through 200 meters of layered sedimentary rock and the canyon formed in one afternoon and you can see the layers as you look around there Here's a close-up with a picture of someone in the picture, an up-to-the-minute rerun, and yet the potassium argon dating is at uh, 0.3 to 2.8 million years, but we know it happened less than 50 years ago in one day. Scientifically, the evidence does not support the millions of years scenario that is so often taken for granted. 
and uh, look so similar to the pictures used to prove. You see, you can't repeat an experiment that involves, well, let's put it this way. 9-11, the towers come down, you can't repeat the event. The Americans would never be surprised the second time. <laughs> but more seriously, the towers are not there. You can't repeat history. You may rerun it, and Hollywood may come up with some clever ways to uh, make it uh, memorable, but it still is not history as we, uh, as we study it and learn it. We have to depend on a different method of learning, evidence and such that we can evaluate. But uh, there's the close-up of that same layering, and each time the volcano went bloop, some more of those layers came down, and it is entirely consistent with a rapid scenario that uh, was uh, believed. I thought I would include a couple of slides from, uh, on the subject of dinosaurs from Beijing. Dragons are not part of Chinese mythology, they are part of Chinese history. And uh, did you know that the word dinosaur was only invented 150 years ago? Uh, I asked the kids, they all know it means terrible lizard. But uh, the historian in me says, okay, what, what came, where did all these dragons that we find in history fit into this? And they fit perfectly well with dinosaurs. Well, that makes sense. But there are repeated accounts. And uh, there's the uh, uh, Chinese calendar. Uh, look at the critters. The rabbit and the... Uh, what have we got here? The ra was that one the rat? Yes. And uh, the various di tiger and so forth and so forth. The monkey, the, r the uh, rooster. There is a dinosaur. And oh, there's the rat. That's right. Why would you put an imaginary critter alongside 11 other real critters that you knew? Historically, that doesn't fit. You've got to have some logic when uh, they're producing their calendar. And the animals in the Chinese calendar, 2012, was the year of the dragon. We could have said the year of the dinosaur because the two terms are interchangeable. So, but here's one from our own situation. In 1845, they found a decaying body on the outside of uh, Geelong down in Victoria and uh, they, uh, the artist did a sketch and the Aborigines confirmed yes that's what it looked like and uh, the bone was found in the Barwon Lakes area they called it a bunyip and uh, the story was in the Geelong advertiser complete with the sketch and it fits with Edmontosaurus which was discovered in France just 17 years later. But I find it interesting because I went out to Western Queensland uh, and had a look at the bones of Mataburosaurus. We used to joke about the blind dinosaur called Musantosaurus, but I won't go there just now. Uh, sufficient to say that uh, the duckbill dinosaur fits quite well with the bunyip. And the critter was around with people not millions of years ago, worth noting. And uh, there's the Welsh flag. I, I remember camping in one camping area and a bloke had the Welsh flag on the back of his caravan. So I thought I'd got to go say good day. And we had a fun conversation and when I was ready I said, now tell me about your flag. Oh, well, you know, the Wales and so forth. And I said, and of course uh, that's a good picture of a dinosaur, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I suppose it is. And I said, so they were there with people. Oh, interesting. But there it is. But I could give you data from China, the Welsh flag, uh, Cambodia. There's a picture. Oh, I should mention somewhere along the line. I have set aside a, chapel in, a chapter in my book, You Can Make an Impact. And I brought a dozen or so of them if anyone is interested, so, so I don't forget to tell you later. I'm told I should be charging 16 or $18 for it. I'm happy with $10. And if you can't afford it and you want to take it as a gift from me. But one chapter, it's a book on leadership. And one chapter I've devoted to this issue of evolution and creation because it is so important for leaders to be clear on that. And in the book I actually have a picture of the carving from Cambodia. As soon as I show it, the kids say, oh, 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 that's easy, that's, that's uh, 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 st steggy. So, but then they asked me, how would dinosaurs have fitted on the ark? Well, I discovered that uh, their eggs were the size of a football. A large football, but eggs, I've seen dinosaurs, eggs that are smaller, but that one will do. And um, there's a little dinosaur that they dug up along the way. Newly hatched dinosaurs were small. They didn't grow rapidly for about five years. 
so that Mr. Noah could very well have taken on board younger dinosaurs about the size of a sheep and uh, that wouldn't have created... Oh, the other thing I haven't touched on in my slides, but uh, there's a good weight of evidence that if the critters on the ark were to hibernate, that would solve the food supply problem and also the mess. You might reflect on that. My, my brother-in-law is a beekeeper and he told me uh, down in Tasmania, the beekeepers take all their bees up above the snow line in wintertime. They all hibernate and then when springtime comes, away they go doing their good thing, getting some more honey. It's cold, they go to sleep and they don't... And the same could apply very easily to the animals on the ark. It's very, very viable. There's details on that. The books that are available to you tonight will give you that data. I chose not to bring them this morning because it gets too complicated. But there's your flood legends around the world. Now, this is the historian part of me that says, where did all these people groups get the idea of a universal flood if it didn't really happen? And I look at 59 in North America, 46 in South America, 31 in Europe, 20 in, in Asia, uh, 17 in the northern part of Africa, appears to have been lost in the southern part, and 37 includes not only our own country but the ocean uh, uh, islands of Oceania. That's a lot of stories with common content to it about animals going on a boat, about the guy sending out a bird and all of the high mountains being covered. That's very, very consistent. And I put up a picture as well of a modern aircraft carrier because most people do not realise that the Ark was roughly aircraft carrier size, one and a half football fields in length. The thing was huge. So where did all these people groups get the idea of a global universal flood with a very large boat that didn't have any engine or sails or method of travelling, it simply had to float? So, uh, especially when the stories have so much in common. Did you get it, David, or would you like me to wait? No? All clear? Good. Uh, when I was at uni, one of the things I wish we could have done was taken pickies of the stuff on the screen but we won't go there, not always that it was legible, but that's another subject. Now, one of the things that the kids are learning is plate tectonics, and it fits perfectly with the... Have you ever wondered where there was enough water to go on top of Mount Everest? Hang on to your seat, here's the answer. The movement of the plates into the water would raise the water levels the movement of the plates later away from the oceans to the land would lower the water levels and that is entirely consistent with Psalm 104 verse 8 that says the mountains rose up and the valleys sank down. Did you know that there are um, water bearing deposits of fossils at the top of Mount Everest? It wasn't that high then. When the plates pushed Oh, I suppose I should make it easy for you, shouldn't I? When the plates push south from Russia and north from Southeast Asia and they collided north of India, what do you think happened to the, the uh, plates? They pushed the mountains up and it is entirely consistent with the model. In fact, John Baumgardner, down in this corner, a profoundly committed cre creationist, has said... For the first time in 200 years, the Christian church has a scientifically demonstrable explanation of the flooding of the global flood. The plates moving, raising the water level, the plates moving again, lowering the water level. In fact, that fits very well with... Anybody been to Carnarvon Gorge? Grand Canyon? If you think about the gorge, the water came off the inland and down through the gorge. I have flown over that gorge in a light aircraft and it is so obvious and that's part of why we have such vast flat land on the inland in the US and in Australia. It fits very, very well. So, movement of the plates. Uh, the mountains rose up and uh, there we go. Layers that form the uppermost part of Everest composed of fossil bearing water deposited layers and I've put the reference there in case you wanted to research uh, the uh, reference because it's coming from a, a text, scientific textbook. Now, you've heard about radiometric dating if you've done any reading on this one. So I've got a little analogy that you might enjoy. 
supposing that someone said that there are six litres in the bucket and it's dripping at one litre per hour, how long has the tap been dripping? Anybody want to have a go? Or do you need a bit more information before you come up with an answer? For example, would it be useful to know uh, how much water was already in the bucket? Secondly, was the drip rate constant? What if some kid came along, turned the tap on, had a drink and turned the tap off to a different position? That would affect the drip rate. What about if Fido had a drink? So there are a number of explanations. Oh, and does the bucket have a leak? And without that information, you can't calculate. That's why, in actual fact, the, uh, the labs do not measure time, they measure chemicals. And they work it out from there. It is not a reliable scientific method. Radiometric dating labs do not measure age, they measure amounts of chemicals, and from this they infer age based on underlying assumptions. And when you assume, you make an ass of you and me. So, carbon dating can't go back, by the way, more than 70,000 years. So, how you doing? Is anybody feeling as if their head is being a bit stretched? <laughs> I've tried to put together some of the basic stuff. This slide set started off at 73 slides. And I thought, no, I've got to cut it down to stay within our time, but you'll get the opportunity to ask the hard questions, save all the hard questions for Ron Nella tonight. But um, here's one that I think is equally relevant on a different front, and Emily, you will find this one to reflect on. Uh, your science class on for ages, you're a bit down. What happened? Our teacher said, we're nothing special. We just came from pond scum. We're nothing more than evolved apes. What's your next class? <laughs> Self-esteem. I had four very happy years school teaching. Loved it. Actually, I think my kids, well, the parents thought it was good anyway for their kids because they did learn to read and write, even if I had 46 kids in my first class. Uh, it was enjoyable, and I look back on it very happily. But they didn't have classes for teachers on how to counsel the kids when one of their mates commits suicide, which is now happening in our schools. Teachers are getting classes on how to handle it when one of the kids in the... That was unthinkable back then. And I submit to you that part of it has to do with the values and the worldview and the self-esteem, I'll use that word, that the kids do or don't have. When we come back to this book, God made us in His image with a plan and a purpose. And you and I are not filling in time till we die. We are being prepared for an eternity in a place where everybody loves one another where truth is respected, where we admire the majesty of God and His creation. And I submit to you that's a key issue that the Christian church can offer to a, the next generation. So what can we do about it? Number one, please pray. Evil is real. I was delighted to hear you share about the, the chappy thing. Uh, chappies are on my prayer list for every Tuesday morning. And dear God, bless their socks off, you know. <laughs> Give them buckets of wisdom. But uh, consider that there is going to be an ongoing bias in the media. And uh, 2 Chronicles 7 talks about, if my people will call by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, what has God promised to do? Hear forgiven from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. Secondly, prepare. Others can do the research, but only you can do the learning. Please take the opportunity to get to tonight if you can. Uh, I've heard Ron speak. He is an entertaining speaker with a delightful sense of humour, very highly qualified. He has done research in South China Sea, in the Amazon, in Finland and other parts of the world and his story of where there is ongoing evidence of a global flood is a very, very powerful testimony. He did not come from a Christian home. He's not parroting what he learned in Sunday school. He's telling us what he, as a scientist, observed and then found the data in this special book that we read. So, prepare. Pass it on, go and tell. And I will mention creation.com. That uh, 
web source, website, whatever I'm supposed to call it, you can get, there's over um, 14,000 articles now. And you can hunt up all sorts of stuff, type up where did, who made God, does God exist, what about dinosaurs, you type in the question and there is no reason why you can't have that benefit. And uh, I just ask the question, how is God nudging you this morning? I pray that this has been an encouragement for you. Feel free to ask me. I, was, I dumped the slides on where did Cain get his wife, but there is a very, very sound explanation of that. Ask me afterwards if uh, you would like, or I better still ask, ask him tonight. <laughs> so I think that's about it. So uh, yes, don't forget to look at Creation Magazine. Um, we need a st steady diet of truth. I've brought a few copies of the mag if anybody wants to sample them and see what they're like. Just ask me afterward. Oh yes, what do you reckon about that picky? D does that look right to you to suggest that it all just happened by chance? The sand was just falling out of their hand and, and there was all that c beautiful creativity below the sand? Uh, don't miss tonight. Pray with me please. Father in heaven, I thank you for the privilege of sharing with these dear friends that I've come to love. Thank you for a Bible that we can trust, that tells us of our origin and our destiny. Thank you for the awareness that you have a plan and a purpose for each one of our lives, that we're not filling in time till we die but we're very much preparing for a unique role that you have for us from the beginning of time. Bless this people and those who gather or watch it on the Zoom. Continue, I pray, to hasten the day of spiritual awakening in this great south land of the Holy Spirit and bless dear Ron as he comes to share tonight and all who are able to gather. Lord, we tell you afresh that we love you. We are learning to love each other and we are learning to love truth. Let your blessing be upon the day, please, in Jesus' name. Amen.